In this short ANSYS innovation video, we'll be covering two more material families, polymers and elastomers. Now, both of these families can technically be considered polymers. So why do we bother to separate them at all? Polymers we can define as long organic molecules built around a chain or backbone, often of carbon atoms. They exist in two primary categories, thermoplastics, which soften when heated and harden when cooled. An example of this is polyethylene, which makes up your milk bottles. The second is thermosets, which have crosslinks or covalent bonds between the long chain molecules. This causes many changes in the material behavior, but one major change is that now the polymer simply burns at higher temperatures. Think of an epoxy resin. This doesn't soften upon heating after it's hardened. Now, elastomers are polymers, often thermosets. But elastomers can deform elastically or change shape and return to their original shape without any permanent change. Some can deform as much as 100%. How is this possible? Well, many polymers are either amorphous or semi-crystalline. We learn from our ceramics and glasses video that that means that they lack a long-range periodic order. That also means that many polymers have a glass transition temperature. Elastomers have a glass transition temperature below room temperature. That means that their molecules have higher mobility, allowing for them to stretch so dramatically in this elastic fashion. Now that we've defined these terms, let's move on to talking about the families in detail, starting with elastomers. Historically, for a long period of time, we mainly used ceramics, glasses, metals, and natural materials to create products, home, the like. One of these natural materials is natural rubber or latex, which first started being used in around 1550. It wasn't until 1825, however, that we started changing this material by processing it through a process called vulcanization. You may be familiar with the term when talking about car tires. The process of vulcanization adds crosslinks to the natural rubber sap, giving it very different properties. Charles McIntosh created a rubber-coated raincoat in 1825 with this process. As we began using more and more of these elastomeric materials, the first synthetic elastomeric material was developed in 1930, called neoprene. Now, when we're thinking of elastomeric materials, you might think of something like a headband. As you can see, it's able to deform elastically and return to its original shape. This elastic deformation is where we get the name elastomer, and it's perfect for a headband because of this property. Elastomers have very different attributes than the material families we've discussed so far. They're not very stiff. They really wouldn't work as a headband very well otherwise, but they can be very dense. Think of how heavy a car or truck tire is for its size. They also have lower fracture resistance than metals and some glasses. While they still aren't that easy to break, certainly it would take me some effort before my headband would fail. And as I mentioned, they keep returning to their original state. These materials do not conduct heat or electricity very well, as shown here by the low thermal conductivity and high electrical resistivity. Now, elastomers are often used to hold bundles of items together, whether it be bunch of papers held together by a rubber band, a bunch of hair held together by a hair tie or headband. But they can also be used in applications that require a bit more bounce. Take my running shoes, for example. I want to have as much impact resistance as possible when I'm going on a run to help protect my joints. The sole of many athletic shoes or running shoes is made of an elastomeric material. If we're thinking of shock absorbance in a car, that's done by springs in the shocks. I don't have springs in my shoes. Instead, I have this elastomer that provides some bounce. Similar to car tires, the treads on the bottom of the shoe also act as a wear indicator. When all of these treads have gone away, it means it's time for a new pair of running shoes. Now let's move on to polymers, separate from elastomers. This is what you think of when you think of Legos, milk jugs, plastic bags. One of the first polymers developed was called Bakelite. It revolutionized product design. It was easily molded, easily colored up to a point, 
yet it was still fairly stiff and strong. Nowadays, we have many different polymers to work with in product design. For example, designing a water bottle. I like that this bottle is transparent, yet a thick polymer. It means I can see how much water I've drank during the day, but I'm not worrying about it shattering if I drop it on the ground. Polymers as a whole are relatively stiff and dense, but certainly they aren't as dense as, say, ceramics. Their ability to fit in this sort of middle range on our chart can be very advantageous for various products. It's one of the many reasons why polymers are so commonplace in design. They fit a wide range of properties. Similarly, they have average fracture toughness and yield strength. They're flexible and can be strong, depending on the situation and the needs of the final product. While there are some conductive polymers, on the whole, they have higher electrical resistivity and they don't have very high thermal conductivity. Now, polymers are used for more than just water bottles and children's toys. One of the challenges with polymers is the fact they have so many different chemical compositions. You can't just mix them all together and melt them down and expect to get something usable. This means that it's difficult to recycle them, and they often end up in landfills in places they really shouldn't. A lot of effort and research has gone into developing biodegradable polymers in hoping to help alleviate this problem. But they're good for more than just plastic forks. Polylactic acid, or PLA, is a polymer that can also be used as a surgical screw in biomedical applications. It's made from lactic acid, something that is found naturally in the human body. That means when it's used to stabilize a fracture, the screw will slowly dissolve over time, slowly being replaced by new bone growth. This means that eventually, the person is left with zero screws in their body. Just one example of how advancements in one sector of materials can benefit another. We're down to the home stretch. We've covered five of our six material families, ceramics, glasses, metals, polymers, and elastomers. Tune in to our final video about hybrids.